Well, I was scheduled to begin a new sermon series today, but have been restrained by the Holy Spirit from doing so to deliver what I feel is an immediate word, a rhema word, from him to us today. And when you first hear what the Lord has given me, it will probably sound like a word of indictment. But if you'll listen to the whole sermon, you will understand that it's not an indictment, but an invitation that God is giving to us to draw closer in a real and loving relationship with Jesus. Our nation is in the greatest crisis of my lifetime. The signs are everywhere. Now, some may not know how to receive this message today. You may not have been walking with the Lord very long, but I pray that God will speak to you and, and others. Well, let's just admit that 21st century Christianity doesn't look anything like first, Christian, or first century Christianity. It doesn't resemble the first followers of Jesus very much. Today, the Christian thought pattern or Christian faith is built on a little bit of Bible, especially the grace parts, a worldview, and mix in a little politics, and you've got modern-day Christianity. But today, what I'm going to talk about transcends politics. It transcends worldview. We're going to speak to the reality in which we find ourselves. I want to begin by listing some of the things that are going on in this nation right now that trouble me, and I view them as most egregious and most dangerous to our way of life. The first is the attack on American sovereignty and liberty. Yeah. We all watched in disbelief as our nation's leaders allowed what we now know as a communist Chinese spy balloon to cross all the way from Alaska all the way to South Carolina. Now, I'm from South Carolina. We don't allow things to float in the air down there. It, uh, but since then, there have been two or three more instances where we've shot things out of the sky now. You may not realize it, but our nation is closer to war with the superpowers of the world than we have been in 50 years. As Russian warplanes are doing flybys and in, in, in air zones that are right along the coast of Alaska. And warships are being positioned strategically throughout the globe in the oceans preparing for conflict. The free flow of illegal drugs over our southern border is killing our young people at an astounding rate with fentanyl deaths. Then there's the attack on constitutional liberties from within. As we see even our U.S. government and big tech colluding to be able to silence the voices of dissenters. I want you to know something. The attack on the First Amendment in this nation is leading to the time where Christians will be censored from preaching the Bible. And it is leading to a time where they're going to try to silence and persecute the body of Christ and rid the world of our influence. The second thing that bothers me greatly is the demonic indoctrination in our institutions of learning. Now, we have some teachers right here in Middle Tennessee and across the nation that are fighting the good fight. And they are being a light in the darkness. And they are using the platform they have to help reach children. But too often, our children are being fed humanistic lies at the expense of divine truth. And our grade schoolers are being introduced to, to stuff that is nothing less than pornography, and we're allowing it to happen. On the university campus, I believe it was Ohio State recently, they held a big forum on sexuality and pornography and how we needed to embrace positive pornography. And a, a recent a teacher of preschool students recently was quoted as saying childhood innocence is a fallacy. They need to be introduced to sex when they are small. This is where we are. Then there's the sexual expression without limitation. Sex is the fastest growing religion in America today. Hear me. It is being exercised and exhibited without regard for spiritual law, without regard for biblical truth, or even traditional moral values that are thousands of years old. 
I am going to be beginning soon a series on marriage, sex, and gender according to the Scripture. And we're going to equip the church how to have the conversation with the broken culture. Then there are the open displays of all things Luciferian. The nation was shocked this year as the Grammy Awards, as Satan worship was glorified and embraced before the world with girls in cages and people surrounding the character playing the devil, bowing and dancing before him. Just before this went on, CBS tweeted out, Yes, we are ready to worship. The entertainment industry and the political arena is filled with certain people who have aligned themselves with Lucifer, and now they're not holding rituals in the woods. They're broadcasting it on international television for everyone to see. We are in a culture crisis moment where things could go either way in this country right now. All of these things trouble my soul, but there's something that concerns me even more than these things, and that is a church that is lukewarm. The one hope that America has is the body of Christ, the church that Jesus established for such a time as this. It's not the world being the world that's the issue that's the problem. It's the church not being the church that's the problem. We find ourselves in the condition of the last day's church mentioned in Revelation 3 as Jesus makes an honest evaluation. He says to the angel at the church of Laodicea, write the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, that's Jesus, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing, here's the assessment, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness, wow, may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, just as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This evaluation of the last day's church, there are dispensationalists that believe that the seven churches in Asia Minor represent to us seven different dispensations of the church, seven different conditions leading up to the time when Jesus would come. And the very last one, the very last one, Jesus says, there's too much lukewarm living. Someone recently said, today's church is lukewarm and loving it. I want to take a moment and talk to you about what lukewarm living looks like. First of all, it is living that is tempered by the culture. The Greek word used for lukewarm, kleos, which means tepid. It comes from the Greek word kleo, which means to become warm. Not to come out that way, but to progress to a state of warm. It's, the idea is like you pouring a glass of water from your faucet, sitting it on the kitchen counter overnight, and letting that water adapt to the temperature of the surroundings. Okay? And when it does, that lukewarm water is open to contamination. A lot of people in the body of Christ live just like that. Instead of impacting the culture, we're impacted by the culture taking on cultural views and cultural contamination characteristics. It's ironic 
that Jesus ordained the church to be the thermostat for the culture, yet we find ourselves more often being the thermometer. We don't set the temperature in the culture. We only merely reflect it in our own living. But here's the problem with tepid water. It is the breeding ground for bacteria. Lukewarm living is the breeding ground for sin in the life of believers. It is like the glass of water that is no longer connected to the source. Follow me now. And progressively becomes more and more and more like the surroundings. The water becomes stagnant and good for nothing. But the challenge is, since we're disconnected from the source and the gradual progression by which we become warm, we most often do not realize our condition as they did not, and we think everything is good. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yet Jesus had a different report. The second thing that that lukewarm living looks like is that it is based on self-reliance. Look at verse 17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. The city of Laodicea was very, it was very, very wealthy, very independent, very industrious, rich in exports. They had everything they needed in that city except water. So they literally built a sophisticated aqueduct system that pumped in both hot water and cold water from surrounding springs. It would rival modern-day plumbing, uh, plumbing for that day. They knew how to take care of things themselves. They were very self-reliant doing what they needed done. And that same self-reliant spirit had gotten a hold of the church at Laodicea. And it is very much like the modern day church. We become self-reliant and self-sufficient. I, 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 me, me, me. Could it be that we as the church have accepted the cultural definition of prosperity and fullness and in the meanwhile, we have foregone the life more abundant that Jesus came to give to us? Jesus viewed them as wretched. That means miserable. You ever hang around miserable people? Yeah, me neither. Wretched. He says, you're miserable. Pitiable. In need of mercy, he says. Poor, spiritual beggars. Blind, without real spiritual understanding. Naked, fully exposed in their sins. Like with Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they became aware that they were naked and exposed, and they ran and they hid themselves trying to run from the presence of God. Listen, sin left them exposed to the elements, and it will leave us exposed to the elements as well. Self-reliance, trying to be the body of Christ without the head, which is Jesus Christ, leaves us miserable pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Hey, they didn't like it at first over in Lebanon either, okay? I don't know when I've cared about that less, though. I'll just be honest with you. Because as much as I want you to love me, I love you more. And I don't want to see today's church die in the midst of a move of God. The third thing that lukewarm living looks like is spiritual ineffectiveness. Jesus said you're neither hot nor cold. It would be unlike Jesus who gave his life to bring us into to unity with God, into communion with God, to say, I wish you were cold towards God and indifferent. No. I believe he's saying just like those springs that were piped into Laodicea, that cold water has value. It is refreshing and life-giving. How many Christians do you know who are living in a way that's refreshing and life-giving to the people around us? He says hot water is useful. Hot water can bring healing to wounds. It can bring purity where there's impurity and it can wash stuff away. And Jesus says, your life is not refreshing. It's not bringing joy. 
It's not bringing any kind of revitalization, nor is it bringing healing or purity to the culture. Yet we find that the water is lukewarm. Hear me. Lukewarm water is good for nothing but inducing vomiting. If you need something out that you don't want in, go get you a big glass of lukewarm water. It's coming out. I promise you. And Jesus says, because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Today's church has programs without power, form without function, legalism without life, and preaches a message of righteousness without repentance. A spiritually indifferent church, an apathetic church, a church that's lost its zeal for God and for the loss cannot be the church the 21st century culture needs to find Jesus. The world is falling apart around us, so the church needs to get it together. We need to denounce our self-reliance and begin to seek divine direction. The next words of Jesus, I believe, are divine directives to the last day's church that we find ourselves in. And the first thing he tells us to do is to refocus on the eternal. Look at verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. While there is no sin in being materially blessed, material blessings are not what makes us rich. It is that which is eternal, that which money cannot buy that truly makes us rich. It is that which Jesus Christ paid for that we freely receive in the gift of salvation that makes us eternally rich. Ephesians 1 tells us that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. But then it goes on to say, in him being Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Today, too much of the gospel is about material blessing, about walking and gaining stuff in the world. But I'll tell you, the one who is really rich is the one who's been forgiven and whose sins God no longer counts against him. It's the one who's been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The true riches are in his kingdom. They are tried in the fire. They are the treasures from the richness of his grace. I believe that Jesus is calling the church to refocus on the eternal. Secondly, I believe he's calling the church to return to righteousness. He says, and put on white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Laodicea, I told you, was rich in exports. Their wool exports were, were, were it was the heartbeat of their economy. And they were known for selling black garments made of wool. And in a whole city where everybody was wearing black garments, Jesus tells the church, put on white garments. Let's just face it. A redeemed life looks different than that of the world. Come on, somebody. God is calling us to no longer conform to the patterns of this world. God is calling the church to quit trying to fit in to win cultural favor and be ready to stand out by the lives that we live that are reflective of the grace that we've received. He is calling for a return to righteousness in the practical everyday holiness of our lifestyle. A life that resembles the grace God has given us. God is calling the modern day church back to the holiness of life where we live according to our new nature in Christ, not the old nature of our flesh. He's calling us to focus on eternal riches, to return to righteousness, and he's calling us to recommit to truth. He tells them to get salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now, eye salve will not cure complete blindness, but it could address impurities in the eyes 
that present that prevent them from clearly seeing. And I believe in the body of Christ, it is time to wash our eyes. I believe it's time for Christians to know in whom and what they believe and recommit to that divine truth. Paul said to the Corinthians, we don't distort the word. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest knows this. And then where he goes on to say, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Here's the word. The blind can't lead the blind to Jesus. And a church whose theology is made up more of what they hear on the news or what they've heard in the secular classroom rather than what they've heard from the Word of God is a blind church that cannot lead anybody to know Jesus. The blind cannot lead the blind. That's why we need to open our eyes. Hear me. For some, it may be politics that blind you. For others, it may be religion. For more, it may even be a worldview that is more humanistic than theological. But it's time to lay all of that aside and hold to the unending, everlasting truth of the Word of God. It's time to stop distorting the Word for the sake of cultural acceptance and return to the truth. It is time to speak the truth in love so that people will not be destroyed, but will be built up in Christ. When you put all of these things together, what we really see to us is a call to come to Christ. See, one could be, troubled, could be troubled over the condition of the culture, but we must first be concerned with the condition of the church. I believe God is calling the church to repentance. Watch this. Those whom I love. Say that with me. Those whom I love. Here's the invitation. I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I'm just going to say something and I'm asking him to play some sweet music so it doesn't sound so harsh. We're going to have to deal with the devils in the closet before we deal with the devils in the culture. people trying to lead the body of Christ, leading double secret lives. I'm reminded of a story John Bevere once told when he went to this huge church to preach. And he was preaching and he got down in front like we used to and the Lord moved him. He turned around and he shook his finger and he said, there's sin on this stage. He and the pastor had a conversation after church that night. Hey, brother, ease up. We're, We're trying to lead these people to love Jesus. The next night he was preaching, the Holy Spirit got a hold of him again and he pointed his finger and said, there's sin on this stage. Before that week was over, it was uncovered that the worship leader was having an affair with somebody on that stage. I want you to understand something. The church will never deal with the devils in the culture till we deal with the devils in our closet. We'll never walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and do exploits for God as long as we're holding on to secret sins that are destroying our lives and deteriorating our testimony before people. I want you to understand, it's time for a change. Revival doesn't come without repentance. It's time to come to God in repentance because God's love always calls his people back to him. No matter what the devil is in your closet, no matter what's going in your life that's hidden and nobody knows about, God is calling you out of it today to come to his feet and kneel before him and say, Lord, I love you more than I do my sin. He's not giving up on us. He's calling out to us saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. And in his call, listen, there is an invitation to every individual. In the very next verse, we're going to see why the church is lukewarm. He says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone hears my voice 
and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The saddest scene in the Bible is Jesus standing outside of the door of the church that he gave his own blood to purchase. Of the body locking him out, trying to be more culturally sensitive. When we live lukewarm, we shut him out. But notice, he's speaking to the whole church. He's speaking to everybody. But he said, if anybody. He started off saying to the church, I'm speaking. And now he ends up saying, it don't have to be everybody. It just has to be somebody. Listen, if anyone hears and comes and opens the door, I'll come in and fellowship with them, and they'll have fellowship with me the way it's intended to be. Listen, our nation is in crisis. Our world is in crisis. Our culture is in crisis. And if my dad were preaching at this point, he would say this, a world in crisis needs a church in revival. When does revival come? When we repent before God and return to him. When someone gets enough of the status quo and says, I'm tired of just playing church. I want to encounter Jesus. When somebody has the gall to get up from their seat and go open the door and say, King of glory, come on in. This is your church. We are your people. You are welcome in this place. Two weeks ago, in Wilmore, Kentucky, at Asbury University, they were in their theological classes, being taught their theology. They went to their chapel service, which was required for them to go. After the service, I heard this told by the student body president. Almost all of them left, but a couple of people lingered. Not everybody, just somebody. And when they went back to check out what was going on, word got out, hey, a few people stayed around. People started coming to see what was going on and found themselves in the middle of an outpouring of the presence of God. It was sparked by a young man who boldly confessed his sin in front of all of them. And came clean before God. Now, the chapel's still full today. Two overflow buildings are full. The lawn is full. The fire marshal is having to govern who goes in and goes out. People started flocking to Wilmore, Kentucky to experience this revival. And my first prayer was, God, don't let us get in the way of a generation who is hungry to know you in a beautiful way. See... We've seen revival come before. And if we're not careful, our ego and our pride and our set theology will dictate that revival happens the way we think it's supposed to happen. Listen, God doesn't have to ask any church or any denomination or any college professor what revival looks like. He can meet this generation at the point of their need. The great Welsh revival where in five months, 100,000 people came to know Jesus. It shut down police departments because everybody quit breaking the law. It started with a group of young people who were tired of just coming to church. They wanted to experience this Jesus they had heard about. They stayed late. God began to move, and 100,000 souls came to know Jesus because somebody... Not everybody, just somebody. Revival has broken out in college campuses all over this nation. Oral Roberts University, Lee University, and everywhere in between. They're gathering and calling on God. The biggest travesty in our nation has been taking place on college campuses. That's where we've been losing our kids to the faith. 
that's where they're being indoctrinated with the doctrines of devils. It is only fitting that at Christian universities, that's where revival begins. Listen. Lord, help me to say it in a timely manner. It is no mistake. My wife and I have been praying for a revival for two years. Every single day. God work in our nation and send revival to your church. And we're seeing it unfold right now. But it's no coincidence to me that several months back, just a few months back in, in, in the auspices of time as, as a whole, this nation recanted of Roe v. Wade. Hear me? And said, we're not going to have this national sin anymore. It's going to be left up to people and individuals within states. But as a nation, this is bad law, and we're going to get rid of it. I believe that has been a curse over this nation for the past 50 years. I believe it has stayed the hand of God in certain ways. But it's also no mistake, hear me, that the week that the Grammys say we're going to worship Satan... where it comes out into the open. It is no mistake that when people start worshiping the God of this world openly, something will happen in the kingdom of God because revival always comes in a cultural moment. It always comes in a time where it could go either way. And I'm telling you, for the body of Christ, revival is here. It begins with a repentant heart and a return to Christ and a return to holiness and a return to truth. How many of you are ready for revival in your life today? Let me ask you this. Is there somebody in this room Is there anybody in this room who's bold enough to come down to this altar, get on your face before God and say, Lord, I love you more than I do my sin. I love you more than I do anything in my life. It's all about you, Jesus. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Whatever it looks like, Lord, whatever it sounds like, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Is there anybody that says, Lord, I want to see revival in my family. I want to see revival in my heart. I want to see revival in my church. I want to see revival in Middle Tennessee, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on and serve the Lord. Father, we thank you today for this open invitation as each and every one of us sit right here in this moment. I just thank God that we get to be in his presence and that we get to experience the fullness of your glory. And that today, all of you all right where you are, we get to worship God right now in this moment. And it's our repentance, our the forgiveness that we have through Jesus Christ that allows us to usher in, welcome revival in our hearts. No matter where you are this morning, your altar is right where you are. So if you prayed the prayer today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you decided to rededicate your heart to be fully on fire for Him, we want to pray with you today. Day. Simply visit gcchurch.tv, submit your prayer request there, or text the word Jesus to 615-488-7151. We are truly walking out our faith. We will not be a lukewarm church, but we will be the church that is on fire for God, and we will forge in our faith sharing the kingdom of God. Today, if you are new here, we want to say thank you so much for joining us and want to invite you to join our online campus. Simply text the word online to 615-488-7151. Let's do life together. And speaking of doing life together, let's take that next step. Your next step is signing up for Starting Point. Head over to gcchurch.tv, click on the online campus to sign up today. It's a great opportunity for us to get connected, learn more about you, and share about the church and how we can walk together in our God purpose. As you go out this week, celebrate who you are in Christ and know that Jesus is alive and well in you and through you. And remember one last thing, God loves you and so does GC Church.